be burned. I don't care. Was the library still where it used to be? <laughs> I never saw the library. <laughs> I'm, actually, I have never seen the library. Good <laughs> morning. Can you hear me? Everybody want to get started here? Thank you. I wish I could go. Which is where they are. I think that's where they are Welcome to Beth Myers and Todd. My name is Eric Lamb. I am the president of the Board of Trustees, and we're very glad to have you this morning as part of our ongoing series of uh, our morning brunches with various elected officials. So, a little closer to my mouth, thank you very much. So, we're all very excited to have you here. We're excited to have Congressman Bryce here. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to introduce our rabbi, Gary Solomon. Have a short couple words. <laughs> Hope you're tov, everyone. That means good morning. Take it a good morning. Good morning. I know for some it's not such a great morning, but I'm glad to see you everyone this morning. I want to tell you on behalf of our synagogue what a pleasure and privilege it is to have a congressman, uh, Mr. Price as well, a chief of staff, Asher Hildebrand, I believe is here. We're so grateful. Uh, and, and, and of course, members of Beth Meyer Synagogue, but also members of the broader Jewish community, and just people in general in, in the district of uh, Congressman Price. Um, I'm really here just to kind of first of all, let everyone know that our synagogue uh, you know, is, is grateful and excited to give an opportunity for everyone to hear from our, our congressman a chance to understand and discuss ideas. I recognize, I think we all recognize, that these are tense political times. Uh, many of us uh, are having problems even sleeping at night with stressful thinking about what is happening and in our lives and what is happening, and especially as a member of the Jewish community, many issues are, are rising to the surface. The energy in this room is phenomenal, but I also, maybe I can feel the anxiety as people walk in, different feelings arising. I want to invite everyone in the sense of spirit. We are in a house of, of love and a house of God willing peace. And that although I want everyone to feel free in this holy place to bring your questions and bring your thoughts, I want to invite everyone to do so with love. To remember that we are gathering here in a synagogue. We are not gathering in other places that perhaps the congressman deals with. We are gathering in a synagogue, okay? <laughs> so the synagogue is a place where we're asking you to have a higher level of consciousness that there are people in this room in all likelihood that have different opinions on issues. Yeah, in the Jewish community, we say two Jews, three opinions. Uh, so I, I imagine many have different opinions, and we want to give everyone who has an opportunity, there'll be chances for responding and discussing with the congressman. But I want to make sure everyone really opens their heart to doing so with love. That's number one. Number two is our tradition is the noted for, and I mentioned the congressman knows, the issue of questions. We have a holiday called the Passover Seder that's all about questions. Kids in our religious school, it's not who gives the best answer that gets the most honor, it's who asks the best question. So when you have a chance to ask a question, this is not a statement in the way of a question, or how can I get my opinion in another question, how can I make a nice point and get my class perfect? It's a question. We are asking to hold you to be loving in a sacred place of God and to ask a question. We hope we don't have to enforce this in any way. We are a place of love and welcoming and understanding. But we do it, on, sadly, if someone is unable to control themselves, we do reserve the right, our president will, in fact, <laughs> to calm people down, than me, to calm people down. My prayer is that that won't be necessary, that we will find a way, even amongst the diverse views in our community here, to have a rational and loving conversation that's based on questions. But if you find yourself unable to focus, you should feel free to take a few minutes to walk outside, take a deep breath. We have a chapel in the sanctuary. I will need meditation for you, okay? <laughs> but in the end, I want to say is that this is a very important critical time, even in the last 24 hours, and we all are feeling the intensity of this moment. And I want to thank everyone for coming out, but I particularly want to thank the congressman for making that happen. Can you please give him a round of applause? It's not often I get called upon to be the muscle. <laughs> it's usually my wife, that's exactly right. <laughs> so I want to take a, a point of personal privilege here, and I, I want to thank Dr. Price for the support that he has given through what I do. 
uh, worked for the city of Raleigh and is working in transportation. Uh, he was very involved behind the scenes in our work with securing the funding that was necessary for us to move forward with Raleigh Union Station. Uh, he's been very involved in, in keeping up with that project and we really appreciate the opportunity that uh, his involvement has created for us for what we think is going to be a, a really wonderful addition to our capital city. So we really do appreciate your efforts on that project. Congressman Price is not your, your average congressman. Uh, he has a, an interesting uh, area in terms of uh, the 4th District covering Alamance, Orange, Durham, Wake, Orange, Chatham, and Cumberland County. So, <laughs> it's, it's an interesting hodgepodge, and we're, we're very fortunate to be at the, at the center of that. Um, and although he's a, a has an undergraduate degree from UNC, which I will not hold against him as an NC State graduate. <laughs> he went on and, and got another degree at, at Yale and also received his, his PhD uh, in political science at, at Yale as well. He went off there to teach at Duke University for several years uh, and has also has written several books uh, about um, Congress and the American political system. I have to assume that your, your unique perch and, and perspective that you have has provided you an amazing insight to be able to do that. Um, We've gotten new information that uh, he's had his committee uh, assignments uh, recently uh, reassigned. So he's a senior member of the Appropriations, um, House Appropriations Committee uh, with subcommittees for Transportation and Housing, Foreign Operations, and Homeland Security. So we're very pleased to have uh, Congressman Price and his wife Lisa with us this morning. So uh, I'll, at this point, I'll turn it over to Congressman David Price. But uh, we did have yet another redistricting, and uh, 
one, uh, one reason that many of you uh, found my name on the ballot when you had them before this last fall is that uh, this part of Wake County, including this, uh, this temple, is, uh, is now back in the 4th District. So we, uh, that's, uh, I, hope, uh, I hope good for you, uh, certainly good for me. And, uh, we are uh, back in a three-county district, Wake, Orange, and Durham, with uh, a good, good part of the bulk of the population in, in Wake County, including this part of the county. All right, I, I, I want to briefly touch on, on five topics uh, before, we, uh, before we have our, our discussion. Uh, the first has to do just uh, with the events of the week, uh, the, the, the refugee situation, but also the uh, just, just a, a, a series of things that went on in, in Israel and uh, the region, which uh, are kind of open a window, I think, on, on some decisions and uh, developments. Uh, just as a way of, uh, of, of getting a, a, an overview. Secondly. Uh, I, uh, uh, well, uh, the, the refugee situation, the, the, week, the events of the week in the Middle East. Uh, thirdly, just then step back and uh, look at uh, the um, two-state solution efforts that uh, our country, pretty much on a bipartisan basis for many years now, has, has stood behind. Uh, the the two-state diplomacy, uh, talk about some uh, controversial uh, developments at the end of the Obama administration, and. <clears throat> the way I saw those, the way I think they, um, they might influence the debate going forward. Of course, that was the idea, especially with John Kerry's uh, uh, statement. Um, fourthly, the um, status of the Iran agreement. And, and fifth, a few comments about the situation in, in Syria. So, hope that will touch some, some critical bases. Um, but there's plenty to talk about. And if you have other concerns or other, uh, other issues, uh, there, of course, it's a long list. Uh, be happy to, to get into whatever you want to. On the refugee situation, I uh, uh, want to say that uh, this this really is a uh, I think an unprecedented uh, turn of, uh, of, of U.S. policy, and it's uh, it's certainly chaotic. As I just heard the Republican senator from Ohio say as we were leaving the House, uh, if this is about vetting, it doesn't look like this executive order was vetted very well. And at a minimum, the, the kind of uh, chaos that you're seeing and, and these heartbreaking stories, I mean, after all, the people leaving Iraq in large numbers are people who, uh, who are leaving because their lives are in danger, because of their help to our military. And, and they, it's taken years. I mean, there's been ex talk about extreme vetting. I do know something about this by virtue of serving as the Homeland Security Chairman for a while. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the kind of uh, long, drawn out, excruciating process these people have been through, and then to have them uh, stopped in midair, literally, is just, uh, is just incredible. And uh, so, we, we, uh, I fully anticipate that our office and congressional offices around the country will be dealing with individual cases of, of, of people whose situations are suddenly very complicated. A lot of, a lot of, I think the bulk of them were rejoining family members already in this country. So, uh, very complicated uh, situations, and, and um, I think uh, uh, another statement I saw from one of the leaders said uh, we shouldn't mistake cruelty for strength. You know, we need to make some distinctions here. And uh, even if we're going to tighten up uh, even further the vetting process, you don't do it this way. Anyway, we, we have a, uh, I think, a crisis of, uh, of major proportions here. And, and uh, it's uncharted territory for me as well as to, for you. I do want to commend uh, Rabbi Solomon, the other rabbis uh, in the uh, in the Triangle area for a very powerful and moving uh, statement on, on refugees that uh, was just issued uh, days ago. Um, and uh, that, that's the sort of thing that needs to come forth from, uh, from faith communities of all, of all sorts. Um, I, I noticed this morning there's a powerful statement from um, an evangelical group that's not, not usually uh, noted for uh, opposition to 
a, a president of this sort. Uh, and, and so the, the faith, faith community is extremely important. But this, this is, I won't read this except to say uh, um, one sentence. Faced with the largest refugee crisis in all of human history, the United States must continue to be a safe haven for people who flee religious persecution, genocide, and terror. Mm -hmm. And the, the statement goes on to say that that refuge cannot be, cannot distinguish among religious groups Trump has said explicitly, said explicitly, this is, uh, this is, uh, we're, we're going to make an exception for persecuting Christians. I, I think that will be struck down. But uh, if, it, if it won't be, it, uh, it should be in terms of uh, the kind of contradiction it represents of uh, what our country stands for. So, and, and by the way, Israel uh, this week announced uh, for the first time, and of course this is Trump's decision in Israel, but Israel uh, announced this week for the first time that they're going to take refugee children, 100 refugee children from Syria, orphans that will be placed in, uh, in a boarding school situation and eventually foster homes, which is uh, a great gesture and a uh, kind of counterpoint to uh, what, uh, what our own country is, uh, is doing. Um, well, so it was an active week on, on that front. and. Uh, an active week in, in ways that didn't make the headlines uh, as well. So I'm just going to mention a few things that happened, mainly because they do open a window on, on the broader developments and things that we're, uh, we're going to uh, be hearing a lot more of. Um, Netanyahu and uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Trump uh, had a uh, phone conversation, that you may have noticed. Um, the Prime Minister afterwards uh, credited the uh, president with understanding the Iran threat. Uh, he was likely to end what he called the world's silence on the Iran threat. It's interesting though, he did not call for uh, resenting the Iran nuclear agreement. Uh, nor did he report that uh, Trump uh, was going to carry out his campaign promise to, uh, to do that. Um, Israel announced last week the construction of 2,500 more homes and, and settlements on the, on the West Bank. Uh, there was a very contentious cabinet meeting in, in Israel where uh, Netanyahu's uh, ministers to the right urged him to declare the two-state solution dead. Uh, Netanyahu refused, but um, he, then, uh, he then did assure them that he did not support a full a full statehood, a full, full Palestinian statehood, but rather what he called a state minus. What does that mean? It's unclear exactly what that means. Um, I, I, I think it's safe to say it means that, it, that Israel retains control of, uh, of almost all the settlements. Uh, they will have, of course, a military presence to protect those settlements. Mm -hmm. Palestine, Palestine uh, most commentators think under under this would have maybe 50 percent of the existing West Bank uh, territory. In, in other words, it's nothing the Palestinians could remotely accept, and so it's not really not really a proposal, but uh, but kind of a uh, an indication of of uh, where his thinking is is, is going. Um, in the meantime, looming over all this are major decisions announced earlier. In the, uh, in the transition, having to do with uh, the appointment of uh, David Friedman as ambassador to Israel. I assume his views are, 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 are well known. Uh, they certainly are um, occasioning a lot of uh, discussion and controversy. And the uh, decision to move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, which uh, has uh, actually receded a bit because there are very predictable consequences that need to be considered uh, and uh, hopefully hopefully will be considered. Um, in any event, it does appear likely that the, uh, the, the bipartisan U.S. Uh, support for two-state diplomacy uh, is, is likely to be weakened or to be abandoned uh, altogether in this new administration. So when you, when you read the commentary about what is coming out of uh, of Israel in the, in the midst of this. A lot of it has to do with uh, 
uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu in particular, and, and you know, the uh, the governing gov governing body of the country, uh, needing to uh, be more explicit about what Israel actually wants, what is their own disposition toward two-state diplomacy, what do they want from this country? You've probably seen some of the speculation that. Uh, this puts Netanyahu on the spot in a way that he hasn't been before, particularly with respect to his right-wing ministers, Naftali Bennett and others, who have been pushing him for, uh, you know, for annexation or other policies that he's uh, he's resisted. But one reason he's resisted is because uh, it uh, would it would it would represent a breach with the United States. If that's no longer true, he can no longer uh, claim that the defense. Then the question is, what does he do, and what uh, what kind of uh, what kind of uh, uh, expectations and wishes that does the government of Israel have with respect to uh, to our new administration? That mm -hmm. uh, and that Yahoo and, and Trump will be uh, talking. I'm sure repeatedly they will meet in person uh, rather soon. My own guess would be that behind closed doors you will not find that you know, requesting that the Iran deal be uh, abrogated. Uh, certainly his security and military personnel are not recommending that. But uh, there are a lot of questions, a lot of questions about what uh, what this new administration uh, kind of uh, the declaration of no daylight whatsoever between the U.S. and Israel, what that means in, uh, in practical and, and, and political terms. Thirdly, let me say something about uh, the two-state uh, efforts and the shape they took at the uh, at the end of the Obama administration. Um, there were uh, two major moves at, at the end of the administration, both of them controversial. The, the most controversial, of course, was the decision to abstain from a resolution regarding settlements. It, it, it also made some reference to Palestinian violence and incitement, but, but it, was, uh, it was focused on settlement. The U.S. decision um, to abstain rather than to uh, veto that, uh, that resolution. And then a few days later, uh, John Kerry making a, uh, a statement, a, a long, heartfelt statement, I think, uh, going over some of the history of uh, efforts to, uh, to, to achieve a, a, a settlement and, and uh, laying down some principles that he thought were uh, widely accepted as, as the, the basis for a settlement. And if those look familiar, they are, because they are virtually unchanged from the principles that President Clinton laid down on top of as the, uh, as the uh, heartbreaking way that the negotiations came uh, to, a, to an unhappy end at the end of his administration. I'll just quickly read what those are, just as a kind of benchmark for uh, for discussions. These are these are Kerry's uh, Kerry's principles, and, and this really, I think, is pretty much uh, bipartisan U.S. policy up to this point. One, provide for secure and recognized international borders between Israel and a viable and contiguous Palestine, negotiated based on the 1967 lines with mutually agreed equivalent swaps, in other words, in encompassing the major settlement laws. Two, fulfill vision of the UN General Assembly 181, two states for two peoples, one Jewish, one Arab, with mutual recognition, full equal rights for all their respective citizens. Three, a just, agreed, fair, and realistic solution to the Palestinian refugee issue. I won't, I won't read that entirely. It has to do, of course, with the, the, the right of return being, being severely constricted with respect to uh, Israel proper, but there being some compensation, some other ways of dealing with those uh, refugee claims. Uh, but uh, clearly cannot be, uh, cannot open up a state of Israel proper up to a uh, large refugee uh, settlement. Fourth, uh, provide an agreed resolution for Jerusalem as the internationally recognized capital of the two states, protect and ensure freedom of access to the holy site. Fifth, satisfy Israel's security needs and bring a full end to the occupation while ensuring that Israel can defend itself effectively and that Palestine can provide security for its people in a sovereign and non-militarized state. 
And then sixth, end the conflict and all outstanding claims, enabling normalized relations and enhanced regional security for all, as envisaged by the Arab Peace Initiative. So those are the six principles that John Kerry laid down. Um, I, uh, along with my colleague John Yarmouth from Kentucky and 62 co-sponsors, we had in a resolution earlier in this Congress urged the administration to do just this. We didn't presume what form it would take, but we did say that uh, we, we, we hoped that uh, amid a lot of talk about, about how uh, this was hopeless, about how a negotiation between the Israelis and the Palestinians was, was kind of dead in the water on both sides, that we needed at least to serve notice that as far as our country was concerned, this was still an important issue, a critical issue. We, we knew, we understood that any final settlement would have to be negotiated between the two parties, but that our country could uh, facilitate that, should facilitate that, and one way of doing that would be to enunciate the uh, principles that, that we uh, would uh, expect would be honored as such a settlement was, was finalized. So uh, we were glad to see this, uh, this statement by, by John Kerry. The, 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 uh, it was somewhat overshadowed by the, by the controversy over the, over the UN resolution. Uh, this was the first and only uh, UN resolution of this type that the Obama administration had, had not vetoed. Uh, the, the, uh, contrary to what was said at the time, uh, there were, there were lots of precedents in past administrations for, uh, for voting for resolutions or abstaining. But the Obama administration had not, had not done it until this point. And I think it's fair to say that, uh, that this was a matter of considerable discussion and controversy within the Obama administration, how to handle this. It was a, it was a resolution that did touch certain bases in terms of, uh, of uh, what we would expect in a resolution. There was incendiary language that uh, I'm sure it was dropped out along the way. If you, if you want a, a good take on that, that, uh, the, that thinking that, that went into this, uh, Samantha Power gave a very fine statement of the UN, which uh, I commend to you. I think it's easily obtained. And she's very straightforward about, about the UN and about how the UN has, uh, has not been a forum where Israel could get fair treatment or a fair hearing. And uh, we, we're, we're well aware of that. We have fought that for the entire history of the institution. So, so it's, it's, it's worth reading because she's, uh, she's quite honest about uh, the downside of uh, doing anything through the UN. But at the same time, she says you, you, you can't just totally uh, walk away from the forum. And, and you can't just indiscriminately reject anything the forum produces. You have to make some judgments. So she gives the basis on which uh, we did uh, reaffirm our commitment to a two-state solution and did express the view that uh, settlement activity and really stepped up settlement activity uh, was uh, an obstacle to, uh, to achieving that. So that was a, uh, that was a, uh, a point of uh, great controversy as the uh, Obama administration wound down. So not surprisingly, when we returned after uh, the new Congress was sworn in, we were faced with uh, a resolution, House Resolution 11, which condemned, roundly condemned, that Obama action. And uh, that was a resolution that uh, I felt was uh, very uh, poorly and unfairly drawn. It was a thinly veiled uh, political attack on the Obama administration. And, and really a pretty serious misrepresentation of the history of this sort of thing, and also of actually what this resolution uh, uh, did. Some pretty reckless accusations. I do not think our democratic, uh, that this wasn't something that was negotiated out between the two parties. This was something that uh, the Republican side developed and then gave our, our interlocutors, uh, mainly Elliot Engel, the head of the, uh, the, the, the ranking member on the Foreign Relations Committee, it gave them uh, the, uh, the ability to, uh, to make some suggestions. And uh, Elliot will tell you, some of those suggestions were taken by removing some of the most incendiary uh, references to Obama personally. But other references were not. And um, 
So when we arrived in Washington to be sworn in, we were faced in the first day of full session, we were faced with this resolution. And uh, I and uh, a, a number of other members simply balked at it, balked at approving this. They said, this isn't good enough, this, and, and no matter how you feel about what went on at the UN, this, and we had people in our effort that, uh, that were on both sides of that question. No matter you know, how you felt about this, this resolution is, uh, is not a unifying resolution, and it, uh, it has inaccurate and unfair uh, aspects to it. And what we should be doing going forward is reaffirming our support for two-state diplomacy. So I developed, I developed and introduced an alternative uh, resolution, which uh, uh, really would satisfy no one in the sense of solving all the problems. It, it was an attempt to, uh, to state very forthrightly the importance uh, and, and this country's commitment to two-state diplomacy. And uh, Elliot Engel uh, actually joined me in that. So Elliot, on the House floor, was in the interesting position of really being on, on both sides to the extent you saw these as opposing efforts. They weren't exactly opposing efforts. Well, what I was trying to do, and what I wish he had done earlier, is, is develop a resolution that really uh, does, at, at least on the Democratic side, does achieve agreement and consensus, doesn't let anybody drive a wedge among us on this issue, and that provides a basis going forward. Uh, sends a very important signal to the new administration uh, going forward. So we uh, we got, a, I think it's now around 130 uh, co-sponsors for that alternative uh, resolution. We left it open for co-sponsorship. Uh, the Republicans uh, controlling the Rules Committee uh, denied us the ability to have a vote on that on the floor. So uh, I ended up managing the time on the floor in, in opposition to the main resolution, making, making clear that one reason I was doing so was because uh, a, a, a less controversial, more unifying, more focused resolution, uh, or constructive, had been uh, denied a vote. Uh, we got 80 votes uh, against the, against the, the uh, House Res 11. And that, that doesn't sound like many, but actually it's almost half the Democratic caucus, and it represents a, uh, a serious dissent, a serious dissent of, about what uh, 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 the Republicans were, were trying to ram through. Again, just, just very, very um, transparently uh, trashing the Obama administration on their way out the door. So that, uh, that's the best bird's eye view I can give you of that, that drama. We intend to pursue this. We intend to pursue it. The uh, two-state diplomacy is uh, is a, a big question mark now going forward. I think on the Democratic side, virtually everybody is committed to this, and a number of Republicans are as well. So we uh, we've, we've got to figure out how uh, how to uh, uh, have some influence, whatever influence we can possibly have on the uh, diplomacy as it evolves of the of the new administration. And, and uh, make certain that we, we don't uh, we don't just drop this. We don't we, we, we don't just leave uh, events to take their natural course. Uh, we uh, of course it's not promising. Who who would say it's promising right now, either on the Israeli side or the Palestinian side, in terms of the expectations, the, the, even the motivations to go forward with this? But uh, my own judgment is that the long term future of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state depends on some kind of separation being, being uh, made and that uh, this uh, two-state solution has many problems, many obstacles in the way, but it's uh, the best, I think, of the conceivable alternatives. And I, I really think it would be a serious, serious uh, setback for the U.S. to abandon that position. Okay, finally, just quickly. Uh, the Iran agreement, as I said earlier, I don't, I don't, uh, uh, I don't hear a lot of uh, continuation of the of the threats to to uh, scuttle that agreement. 
the uh, compliance. There was, there was another piece of news last week that another critical piece of the compliance uh, fell into place on the Iranian side with uh, the uh, uh, disabling of, uh, of, of centrifuges. Um, now, there are many other ways in which Iran continues to pose a threat, uh, all the way from ballistic missile development to terrorism support, and, and, uh, and, and Iran continues to be a bad actor, a threatening actor in the region. But there's not a one of those problems that wouldn't be worse if that country had a nuclear weapon. That's the bottom line. And, and uh, the, 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 moreover, this is an international agreement. It's a remarkable diplomatic achievement, I, I, I believe, to have held that sanctions regime together, to have held those negotiating partners together. They include, remember, Russia, China, as well as Europe. To, uh, and and uh, the, uh, uh, you, you, I'm sure, have seen the things that the people, past and present, Israeli military and security establishments say about the agreement. So the politics surrounding this, surely we won't, we can't let it uh, lead us to do something reckless about the Iran uh, nuclear agreement. Um, so we, we must not default on, on that. And uh, so far, it doesn't appear to be a, a front burner item. It, it'll be very interesting to, uh, to see what uh, the Israeli government's uh, position on this is. And, and much of that, I expect, will be expressed uh, behind closed doors. Um, finally, Syria. That's a big subject, and I'm not going to say much about it except to say that it's just an un unmitigated uh, humanitarian disaster. Um, it could have been avoided, I, I believe. I, I, people who uh, know a lot more about Syria than I do firmly believe that, that the Syrian government's handling of the Arab Spring was, was just, uh, it, 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 the, the, the protest uh, could have been contained, could have been dealt with, but it just escalated and escalated and escalated. And in the end, you have a, a civil war that has just been unbelievably destructive and has left the country in, in shambles and has left this desperate refugee population. And uh, so we, uh, we have uh, some prospect, some prospect for uh, international cooperation on getting a, getting a ceasefire that sticks and getting some kind of uh, transitional arrangement to going forward. Uh, we've never thought, I've never thought that our interests and the Russians' interests were diametrically opposed on this. In fact, it's always been clear that we had some degree of common interest on this, as, as demonstrated by the handling of the chemical weapons aspect of this years ago. And uh, the negotiations uh, that uh, John Kerry was encouraging before he left, and, and now that the, the, the uh, negotiations going on in uh, Kazakhstan, that, uh, that is, uh, we, we should wish the negotiators well. Although we do have a stake in the, in the, in the settlement and what it looks like. And in particular, the uh, treatment given to the uh, opposition groups that we have been supporting and that uh, we uh, uh, perhaps should have supported earlier. That'll, that'll, be, a, that'll be a question that uh, historians debate for, for, for a long time. So if I was looking for a silver lining in all this with respect to the new administration, I'd say actually that may be an area where Russian cooperation, Russian U.S. cooperation can, uh, can be productive, can be helpful. And uh, depending on how we do it and who we don't throw under the bus in the process, uh, I would, I would uh, encourage that, uh, that that go forward. After all, that's, that, that is continuous with what Secretary Kerry was trying to achieve before he left office. And it's, it shouldn't be a partisan matter. We, we have a we have a stake in getting, a huge stake in getting that, uh, getting that civil war wound down, getting that refugee flow stemmed, and, and, and getting a, a stable and a legitimate government in place eventually in Syria, whether that's a unified country or some kind of federated uh, arrangement. All right, that's the best I can do in terms of touching the bases. Uh, I'd be happy to hear whatever you want to talk about. Okay.
So, uh, what we do here, we have two wonderful volunteers, Lexi Sixamer, our Programming Youth Director, and the wonderful Mayrov Solomon, my daughter, okay? <laughs> who are going to go walk through our community here for questions. Uh, with Congressman's permission, okay, we'll allow you to select each one as we go one by one, is that okay? Sure. Okay, so he's going to point at people, describe perhaps what they're wearing, and... Go ahead. Oh. <laughs> I see, good ball. Eric, you need to wear that, you're doing that, okay. So President's going to select you know, who will go one, 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 okay, and we'll have our people go around and do that. I want to remind you from questions, not statements, brief questions will allow more time for answers. I'm going to President, take it back, the job, the hardest Solomonic job. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, raise your hands and we'll come around with microphones. Is that when you when you use the uh, occupation of the settlement? Either Texas or California are those occupied territory? That's the first question. If that's how you, how you define occupation. Second is that uh, in terms of two-state solution, did we not, in my recollection, or do you remember? that we had two state solutions twice before. In fact, people got peace, pro peace prices for them. And when they were finished and negotiated, they were uh, rejected by the Arab uh, side, meaning the Palestinians, which obviously there never was a country called Palestine, but two state solution is still appropriate, however, in a very, very limited term. Thank you. I, I'm not going to quibble over whether um, this is occupied territory or not. It is regarded as so, as such by the, by the international community, I think, and, and um, it's, uh, it, or at a minimum, it's not regarded as a unitary state of Israel with uh, with the Palestinian residents. There, there is a there is a question about the status of this territory, and uh, that is going to need to be resolved one way or the other. And uh, the uh, one state, uh, one state solution would, would indeed regard this as, as, as Israeli territory, and uh, then the question about the uh, Palestinian population, the kind of rights they have, the kind of suffrage that they're granted, this becomes a, a major issue, as you know what some of the projections uh, look like. So that brings you then to the two-state solution as um, the uh, most promising of, of, of really very difficult alternatives. Nobody's saying this is easy and it's gotten harder. In fact, it may have gotten impossible. I think we just need to acknowledge that. It may have gotten impossible. And, and there are a number of reasons for that. But uh, the, the fact that it has come very close before and has failed, of course, you're right. So what do you conclude from that? Uh, it, uh, and I, I think the, uh, the burden of, of rejecting the, the, uh, the, the agreement uh, falls very heavily most promising of these episodes falls very heavily on uh, Yasser Arafat, on uh, probably the other Arab states who should have uh, had his back more than they did, and maybe our diplomacy that should have concentrated on that more than it did. You know, you could replay that uh, for a long time, and uh, it, it always comes up as a tragic lost opportunity. But I just don't think, I think that's dispositive with respect to the future of our, of our efforts. Still seems to me two-state diplomacy is uh, is the only uh, way, way through this. Even though I have to acknowledge that uh, it uh, is difficult and it has failed in the past. Uh, Congressman Price, thank you so much for your work on the two-state solution. And, and for for so many years, you've been such a wonderful pro um, help for Israel. So thank you so much for that. Um, with all the unrest that's happening and all the discontent with our current leadership, um, knowing that we are mostly in your district and that you are supportive, what would you have us do? In other words, what is the way to, that we can be the most productive without sitting around and, you know, writing our hands and gnashing our teeth and, and basically staying within a bubble? What, what is the most um, effective way that you would have us act to, that would be helpful for you and for your work in D.C. And, and ultimately for our country. That's 
It's always a question I, I uh, sort of dread. <laughs> <laughs> and I especially do now because I, I feel so uh, inadequate to, uh, to, to really come up with a, a, a really exciting uh, suggestion. I, th I think forums like this one, I think uh, work through, uh, through, through organizations. Uh, I, uh, for years, have worked with uh, Nettie Abraham's uh, group, the, the, the Center for Middle East Peace and Economic uh, Cooperation. I traveled with them in, in, the, in the more hopeful days of the 90s, trying to promote the two-state solution in, in various quarters. We were, uh, we were in North Africa. We were in the Gulf. We were celebrating every trade office with Israel that got open. We were, we were celebrating every informal diplomatic tie uh, because we thought those were the building blocks of, 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 uh, of an ultimate security and peace that, and, and showing that it would have benefits around the entire region. Those, those days are, seem pretty distant now. But um, the J Street organization, I think, has made a huge difference. Peace Now organization. The, uh, the, the, there are organizations, that, depending on your point of view and your persuasion on, on some of these issues, they're, 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 you're not alone. I mean, there are, it, there are organizations to work with and support that have um, a, very, uh, a very powerful voice uh, nationally. Um, I, uh, I, I do think the, the, the topic with which we started this discussion this, this refugee crisis just, it just puts this in such a sharp relief for me. I mean, I, I'm just flooded with, with requests of this sort. What do we do? What on earth do we do? And so uh, I uh, always recommend flooding certain people's uh, you know, phone lines. Uh, you know, other, other representatives, not necessarily mine. <laughs> I think a show, of, a show of concern and support, I still believe in that. I think it's important. And sometimes quantity is as important as quality. I, uh, I, I, think, I think public demonstrations of support, the sort of thing that happened uh, last Saturday, from my point of view, was, uh, was very affirming and very, and very unifying. It was, wasn't about any one issue, but it was about lots of things that people are, are concerned about. I don't, I don't think we can stop with that. In fact, the danger of it of a demonstration is that you do it and you think you're done. Of course, it ought to be just the opposite. It needs to, needs to lead to more, more engagement. Uh, requesting, requesting meetings, I mean almost demanding meetings with elected representatives. And uh, I mean, I, I have no absence of those meetings on these Middle Eastern issues. And I, and I, uh, I benefit from that and I'm sometimes brought up short by it because uh, Everybody that comes in to talk about these things doesn't have the same point of view. So uh, they challenge me, I challenge them, I hope. I mean, it's, it, it's the sort of dialogue an elected representative should have. And if the elected representative isn't seeking it, you should seek to establish it. I do think that's important. Um, and then just figuring out what your own situation is and what kind of leverage you have. Are you part of, a, are you part of an institution or a professional association or a a National Association of Rabbis, in, in the case of Eric, who, who can, uh, can collectively express a view forcefully. And, you know, there's strength in those sorts of numbers. So, so those are just random thoughts. Uh, so if the shoe fits, wear it, I guess. I, uh, I, I don't have any silver bullet, and uh, goodness knows we need one. <laughs> Uh, thank you for coming. Um, I regretfully live in the part of Wake County that you no longer represent. <laughs> question has to do with uh, political operatives. Uh, I, I assume Steve Bannon is the case in point. Yeah. <laughs> Being on the uh, National Security Council. No, it's very, it's very concerning. And uh, I, I, since you brought it up, I'll, I'll continue a little bit because I, uh, 
one of the most alarming things was when uh, Ron Dermer, the, the Israeli ambassador to the U.S., called out Steve Bannon by name with the history, with Breitbart's history. You know about it. He called out Steve Bannon by name and said, this is a guy we look forward to working with. I mean, what message does that send? It, it just takes your breath away. And so uh, this, uh, this, a, a lot of this, what we're seeing, I think, is pure Steve Bannon. I, I know the new Homeland Security Secretary very well, and I've thought a lot about him in the last 24 hours. John Kelly, a general, he's conservative, but he is solid. He's, he's a man of good, solid values and, and solid experience. Maybe the best appointment of all of these. I don't think this is John Kelly, this operation we're seeing right now. I don't know what he's going to do about it or what he's thinking about it. This, this looks to me like Steve Bannon. Just like the inaugural address. Where did that come from? <laughs> you know, just just the, this this notion. Just think about this, this this notion, which goes against our entire post World War II history, at least. The notion that that trade trade is uh, a zero sum game. The notion of mutual benefit is nowhere to be found. If if, if some other country is doing well in trading with you, then you must be doing badly. And if your alliances, something as basic as NATO, if, if, if NATO is, uh, is, is doing well, then it must be because uh, other countries are taking advantage of you, the United Nations even more. This kind of zero-sum, dark view of the world is, is uh, destructive, I think, of diplomacy and of, of the kind of relationships we've had. And I, I don't know how far it can go on a, on a unilateral basis, so to speak, on the part of a new president. We're, we're testing that. But I, I think I know intellectually where it comes from. And I don't think this guy has any business on the National Security Council. Uh, good morning. Uh, as a member of the Social Security Group, uh, I'm kind of curious to know what the outlook is in real terms for Social Security benefits, uh, Medicare benefits, Medicaid, and all that. Very uncertain right now. Um, I'll, I'll just give you a very quick answer, which uh, will uh, maybe indicate what the, what the big issues are. Um, in this in this instance, you're, what you what you got to look at is um, the relationship between the new president and the uh, Congressional majority, and uh, of course they they have been wanting for years. Uh, Paul Ryan, especially the, the, the document here, the template is is Paul Ryan's budget from years ago. They've been wanting to uh, convert Medicare really into Obamacare, which is to say, make make Medicare a private insurance program and, and give people vouchers. Um, they've been wanting, of course, to abolish uh, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. And uh, give people tax credits. Uh, on Medicaid, the idea is to block grant Medicaid and to basically turn it over to the states with a lot less money from the federal level. And then with Social Security, we've heard less. You, uh, you can go back to the George W. Bush administration and look to the partial privatization schemes there, but, um, but really both sides have been pretty cautious in the present environment about, uh, about that. But, but naturally, that, uh, that looms as well as a as, a, as on, on somebody's wish list, probably a lot of people's wish list. So um, my guess is that um, Medicaid, we better watch out. We have issues in this state about expansion, which it is, if, if, you have, if you ask me what the worst thing the current leadership of the state did, the legislative leadership did, the worst thing, there are a lot of candidates for that, <laughs> but in terms, of, in terms of just sheer human impact, denying 500,000 people health insurance when they could have had it. Uh, just, just takes the, it's just all incredible that, that they did that. And, you know, a lot of Republican states that didn't do it, that did take advantage of the expansion, including Mike Pence's Indiana, John Kasich's Ohio. And, and that, I hope, will inhibit some of the worst things that might happen to Medicaid, because some of those states are, are going to want to 
continue covering these people. So, so I don't know. But I, I do think the main peril is with Medicaid, which after all is widely seen as a poor people's program. Although it really isn't. I mean, who do you think is paying the freight for nursing home patients all over this country? Uh, Long-term care. Uh, half of Medicaid goes for that. And those aren't poor people. Those are people like us who just uh, don't have the resources to uh, maintain long-term care. So there will be some political uh, fallout. But I think the real fear on the Republican side is that the universal programs, namely Medicare and Social Security, that those are very difficult to, uh, to, to mess with. That's what Trump decided. What I expect, I guess, if I had to predict, I expect they'll go after Medicaid, try to block grant it. I expect also there will be a serious effort, may not be successful, but there will be a serious effort to uh, take Medicare in the direction of, uh, of a privatized scheme. I don't think they'll take on Social Security. Representative Price, um, my concern is really around um, all of the executive orders that have been coming down the last week, and it just seems to me like we have abandoned the um, multiple layers of democracy and everything's being done out of one branch instead of um, the way it's traditionally been done. And I'm wondering um, what can be done about these from a legislative point of view and if there's anything that the citizenry can do to help you in um, bringing our government back to where we do have checks and balances and where we do have things that are being done as laws rather than um, executive orders that are only being handled through one branch of government. Well, that's, uh, that's something we're going to have to come to grips with uh, very quickly. And uh, there's, uh, there are some checks in place. You saw, you saw some of this overnight with the uh, court orders about uh, the people who have, uh, the, the, the refugees who have been detained in airports. So, so the courts have some, some, um, some resources here to, uh, to counteract some of this. And uh, a lot of the things that we're, uh, that, that a lot of the subject matter of those executive orders, like the Affordable Care Act, one of which was uh, pretty much a hollow shell, pretty ominous, but still, it's going to take legislative action to implement that. And so, so there are, uh, there, there's going to be a rather complicated process here where uh, these executive orders uh, either, get, uh, uh, either, either get qualified in some way or uh, they, they either will or won't get implemented with, uh, with positive legislation. Um, the, uh, we've gone pretty far in this country toward, uh, toward presidential, toward presidents having uh, unilateral authority. And are, are certainly claiming unilateral authority. And sometimes it's successfully checked, and sometimes it isn't. Uh, one good example from the Obama administration was the executive order to close Guantanamo Bay. Most of them, I think, anyway, that's that's a good idea. A good idea, assuming it could be done in an orderly way. But that never happened. It was never going to happen because it was it was checked by uh, by riders to appropriations bills in this case. Um, there was lots of accusations that Obama was an imperial president. That he was uh, he was issuing executive orders left and right. Uh, he did do a few of those, but I think uh, I, I know it wasn't out of line with uh, with uh, President Bush and all the others. It, it, it has become a, 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 a hallmark of the modern presidency that you want to see some of this. So it's not that you uh, can declare it all illegitimate. But uh, you, you would look for some discretion, some respect for legal precedents, some respect for the other branches of government, and for just some care, some, some calculation of, of consequences as these things are done. And that's what I think is missing in what we've seen this first uh, week. So uh, there is plenty, not just to criticize here, but to push back on, and we will do that. I certainly intend to be part of the pushback, but uh, the, the criticism is not that 
executive orders are, are out of line. The question is how you use this authority and, 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 and really the, uh, the extent to which you operate within the bounds of, of the Constitution and, and law. Uh, thank you, uh, Congressman Price. Your opening comments about the refugee situation, it ties it pretty much back to the last question that was raised to you. Is there anything that Congress can do to overturn or block the executive order on the refugees? And if so, what is the likelihood, given the makeup of Congress, that, you, that can, can set, uh, successfully be done? The answer is yes, the authority most certainly exists, but the real question is the one you ask. Well, what does it take to tip the balance here in terms of the people running the Congress and their willingness to, uh, to take this on? I, I watch that very carefully, I'm sure you do too, about, about the key, key players and what they're saying. And uh, there, there is a lot of uh, angst on the Republican side about, about all this, and especially this most recent uh, firestorm. But uh, you notice Paul Ryan was not among the protesters. He said, this is, this is long overdue, this is just fine. And uh, Mitch McConnell, I think, just didn't say anything. So, so you, you look for these key players, and, and, I, and I think that's, that's one reason, though. I think the kind of pressure these people feel from home and, and the urgency that they feel to at least do something. I, I noticed, uh, I was watching also our uh, foreign relations chairman, Ed Royce, the, author of the aforementioned resolution that I, that I was describing. Uh, he, uh, he hedged his bets a little bit. He, he said this, this was uh, something that needed to be done, but this has been badly mishandled, and all these people shouldn't have been stranded in airports, and kind of leave, left himself a little running room as to the way he may, may deal with this. So, so I, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't expect a Republican outright to reversal of this, but um, I, I think there, there's going to be a good bit of pressure from the Congress on the administration to clean this up, to, to start to clean up the enforcement aspects, and, and that maybe You know what syntax? Alcohol, tobacco, and firewall? Those two questions don't come up from any politician on any level. It's a dirty word, I think, or something. What's your position on it? Uh, I, uh, I'm very strongly opposed to a flat tax, which would be uh, radically uh, regressive. It would, uh, it would, it would Assuming you kept revenue constant or close to constant, the practical effect would be a huge, huge tax increase on the middle class people. You know, if, it, if you set a percentage in law, 10%, then the revenue's got to come from somewhere, and then, then, then you figure out where that is, probably from a consumption tax. But he was saying that there would be no deduction. You wouldn't have to fill out any form. Yeah, you, you could do tax reform with no deductions still couldn't get to a 10% rate, um, certainly a 10% flat rate. So you'd have, a, you'd have a huge tax reduction, of course, for people in the top, in the top uh, ranks, and you'd have, uh, you'd, you'd have a, a, an unmet uh, obligation, which uh, I don't know how it would be met, but the chances are that the overall effect would be uh, pretty radically uh, regressive. Um, tax reform now, I mean, I think when you say it doesn't come up, I think this whole debate has kind of morphed into uh, a tax reform discussion. And uh, almost anybody, including me, would accept the general proposition of tax reform, that you, you can lower the rates, corporate and individual, if you uh, reduce the number of preferences or, or the loopholes. And uh, in general, that would be a, a step forward. Our corporate rate is too high in, in international terms. Of course, a lot of people pay nothing. But that speaks to the loophole question. You could get the rate down, you could clean up the preferences, and, and that, uh, in theory, would be a good outcome, both for personal and corporate taxes. 
the trouble is the, the devil in the details with those uh, with those loopholes or those deductions. Uh, some of them charity charitable contributions. You want to wipe out that? You want to wipe out uh, uh, tax-free municipal bonds that, that cities all over this country use? You will, you, you know you know you really get into some pretty controversial territory pretty quickly. Having said that, I do think there will be an effort at tax reform, and we'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, clearly, it would be desirable to move in that direction of lower rates. And what about the sin tax? Clean up preferences. I'm sorry? What about the sin tax? Well, sin taxes are pretty uh, pretty high already, aren't they? We, we, uh, our state hasn't taxed tobacco as much as most states have. We, we've, take, we've certainly taxed the beer and wine and spirits, and uh, it's... Um, it's, it's most of the public will, will readily agree to jack those taxes up, especially if that's the alternative is something that affects them, like property or income taxes. So uh, I, I think that's uh, a, a legitimate source of, uh, of revenue that should be under constant scrutiny. Well, thank you very much for coming and talking to us. I'd like to ask a question. I'm December 23rd, 2016, I felt I was disenfranchised by the vote of the United Nations, the lack of vote of the United Nations, um, of the United States on that. How can, and my question is, how can the United Nations and, in effect, the, uh, the United States say that the uh, Western Wall and the Jewish Quarter is occupied territory? I feel that that is not occupied territory. That is the historical homeland of the Jewish people. And this is where, I mean, Jerusalem, every, I know that most of the people here, but most of them, we say during the uh, Passover, uh, this year we are here, next year we be in Jerusalem. So we are part and parcel of the Jewish people. And I'm saying that or the Jewish homeland. What? How can you say that? Or how can the United Nations, which of course is 53 Muslim countries, say that uh, Jewish people uh, have no right to the Jew Western Wall and the uh, Temple Mount? Well, the resolution didn't quite say that, but there was ambiguous language in it that led to uh, a, a lot of discussion and a lot of controversy about the uh, the holy places and about the J Jerusalem and the status of, of Jerusalem vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the, of, of the West Bank. So uh, that, uh, if you read Samantha Power's statement, uh, you'll, you'll see that that is, a, is referenced as a, as a problematic uh, aspect of this resolution that, that led us to abstain rather than to support it. Thank you, Cut. Price, and I think you do great work, and you're a very reasonable man, but these are very unreasonable times. So a, a very specific thing of what just happened yesterday. So an executive order is issued, which is illegal and very likely unconstitutional. Federal courts block it, and then apparently the White House immediately informs the CDP to ignore it in Virginia and New York. I mean, this was the last thing I heard last night. Right, that, that and if that's true, you, what, what did they do exactly? Last, the last thing that happened last night was that after the federal courts blocked uh, the executive order and, and issued a statement saying that it would, they should allow these people in, apparently the White House informed the CBP that they should ignore, excuse me, that they should ignore the order. Border controls and border protection. Border control, border protection. Well, they should. So my question is, yeah, that, that the, the White House said that they should ignore what the federal courts just said. And my question is really very specific. If that's true, if the White House is telling, you know, people within the government to ignore federal orders. I, I don't even understand what that is. I mean, is it an impeachable offense? Is it illegal for him to do that? Uh, because, I mean, that's really, really shocking. And, and what was happening in Virginia and New York,
that they were, they were literally telling the lawyers that even after the federal court had been, the federal orders had been issued, that they they did not have to allow them to see their lawyers or release them. Well, that that is absolutely over the line. Um, and what do we Asher, do? I, I'm just going to ask Asher here I, because I I heard this morning something different from that, and I don't know what's what's really the operative. I I heard or read some somewhere the uh, the directive from CBP. CBP is Customs and Border Protection, the Department within Homeland Security, and their directive said the opposite, said that the court orders would, would be honored and must be obeyed. That's an alternative path. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, whatever, whatever it said, if, if the White House did, the White House did yeah. what you say, that, that's, uh, that, that, you know, they, whatever the full extent of the law is, should be, should be applied. They, to that he situation. reported that the customs agents are ignoring so, the judge and enforcing so, Trump's so, uh, uh, chaotic, uh, travel ban. That um, you just, you just worry that so Eight, many people are falling through the cracks here. No, the associated cracks. Having their legal rem legal rights and remedies uh, honored. Well, uh, well, I, well, my Eleven hours ago, that is true, which I think he's going to continue to do these things. But I think he What is that about? I mean, what is he doing there? Is he breaking the law as the president and he's telling federal people to not? Mm -hmm. Yes, the answer is yes. I've okay. dug into how I mean, many stories. Okay. I don't know quite uh, what, what the remedies, what the range of remedies looks like, but the answer is clearly yes. The follow-up is, what are you and Congress going to do about it? Congress has the power of impeachment. What are you going to do? So the question well, is, what what's your line full, for voting for impeachment? The full what's range your of remedies. Stand? I don't know what those will be. See, he's ducking it. What are you going to do? He can introduce an impeachment Congress, resolution. Congress, he can you very introduce much. one. He can introduce one. Um, I talked to you a little bit before before you talked, but I want to have a question for you. I've got a lot of friends who are suffering right now. I've got Muslim friends that are scared to death. I have LGBTQ friends and loved ones that are scared to death, and I have female friends that are absolutely scared to death. I got so frustrated last night, as I shared with you, I'll share with everybody else, that I actually started on change.org a petition to ask Congress to impeach this president. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But my question to you is this. What succinctly can we do to feel like we are not drowning in the wastewater, that we feel like we can take our country back. And I, I really need some succinct ideas because I am starting to feel that I have no hope. And I don't like that feeling. I, I feel inadequate to answer your question, but I will try because we've all got to try, right? And we, we've, got to, we've got to figure out what avenues are open to us. And by the way, it isn't just a matter of, uh, of a massive, a massive rejection of this, uh, of these uh, unacceptable moves on the president's part. It's a matter of, of a sustained effort. As long as this lasts, as long as this lasts, there's going to be the kind of pushback that can, can uh, uh, turn it around. Uh, Right now, then, uh, then, then uh, down the road. So we, we've all got to figure that out wherever we are. You know, the first, the first thing I'd say when you talk about the, the friends, the associates who are who are just right and who are feeling abandoned. You know, they're, they're, we need to reach out. To, uh, one of the most moving experiences I've had as a member of Congress. It's very difficult, but Lisa was with me. Visiting over at the uh, over at the mosque after the three students were, were killed in Chapel Hill, and uh, you know it, it really was uh, heartening to see how people reached out to that community and, and, and actually how that community received that. You, you, uh, you just uh, have to figure out where where you're sitting.
situated and what you can do about things. I mean, there are people out at the airports all over this country right now trying to, uh, trying to, uh, they, they know who's coming in. They were prepared to greet them. They were prepared to give them housewarming parties and, and get them situated. So, so uh, I don't have reports from that, except I know it's going on, and I know that it's, uh, for, for some people, it's the most direct and most immediate thing that they can do. So, uh, just on a human level, that, that kind of uh, expression of affection and understanding and solidarity, I, I think is very, very important, and, and all of us are probably differently situated with respect to how we can do that. So, it's 11.30 this It's not totally dead on, on a personal level and, and or, or official level either. I, I think, like a lot of other things, when you're asking the question, I find myself wondering, well, what's the future of that? Uh, because uh, I think we, I think our Republican colleagues and friends are really going to be tested, as we said earlier. And there, there's, there's going to be a time of testing here, which uh, will put strains on, uh, on everybody. I, um, I've been in my leadership positions in the House have both been in areas that aren't highly partisan, which has uh, has been uh, been a good thing. This House Democracy Partnership, this work with parliaments, is, is resolutely nonpartisan, and we keep it that way. And that and that's a source of personal friendship and colleagueship, as well as uh, I hope productive activity. And then appropriations, the funding committee. That's the, I'm the only North Carolina member of our corporations. We uh, appreciate the kind words about uh, Union Station and, and the, uh, the, 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 the efforts we made there. Uh, the, uh, the Appropriations Committee has a history of bipartisanship as an institutional body that safeguards the power of the person.